this is the modern American buffer lark, Evolution Beyond the Tabletop. I'm your moderator. It's a surprise to me as well. Um, I will be attempting to remember the questions and um, introducing our panel today. And since I am very poorly equipped, I'll let them introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Trisco Cruz. Um, I've been a writer for a couple of different games, and I have developed a couple of games, uh, including Play Break and like a couple of different systems for uh, other games that I participate in. Um, I'm starting up a new company that doesn't exist yet. Yeah, we do. Yeah. Hey, what's up, y'all? I'm Brody. Um, I uh, had kind of an ethnographic relationship with uh, a buffer lark for a little while, and then um, I'm on this panel because uh, last year I, I principally developed a uh, buffer rule set that was uh, based on working against um, some of the social reification that comes with like mechanical growth and investment within a community um, and moving against some like the coercive nature of like stat and build systems. Um, I think that like buffer LARPs are like the most important site of action in the United States uh, due to their like the relevance of, of uh, class and accessibility and the communities that form around them. So uh, that's my steez. Um, my name's Jeremy Merritt. I'm the creator and owner of Doomsday and uh, one of the co-owners of Edge Forever, which is, uh, produces a number of, uh, produces two games right now and we'll probably be uh, adding a few more to our repertoire in the next uh, few months to the next little year or so. Um, I'm Haley, and I was a staff member for Alliance um, Oregon um, many, many years ago. Uh, that was in 2004, um, and I was part of um, Alliance um, in the early 2000s. Um, I helped um, design, do some early design work for Beyond the Ether, which was one of the Pacific Northwest games uh, built to sort of mediate some of the, um, the negative aspects that we had come to accept were being changed about Alliance. Um, so we did some, some DIY gaming. Um, and uh, for my own part, I was a buffer LARPer for about seven years in the 90s. Nice. I played a, a, a Amp Guard Splinter group called HFS, High Fantasy Society. <laughs> um, so, um, does anyone want to, you, you said, uh, Jeremy, earlier that you had a consolidated how it all got started? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I think, like, like it's, it's, so there's, there's a friend of ours uh, named Josh Harrison who uh, came to me a few years ago with this idea of, like, um, generations of buffer LARPing where you kind of start off with, like, Nero and games like that where it's kind of, it is one step removed from D&D and you can really see that in the rules, where it's just like, it's like, oh, you really just translated this directly from the tabletop. And I've even seen like newer games, which had that as their genesis point, where they have like dexterity and like it's a constitution and all those stats that like I don't know what they do uh, in a buffer campaign. And like it was clear that the people running that game did not know what they did either. Um, uh, that game doesn't exist anymore. Um, but yeah, yeah, no. no. It was possibly the single worst, worst rule system I ever saw. They had league lease points for people that I'm not going to go into it. But yeah, they, they, so yeah, they had, they had a skill called Swager. Uh, it was not a game that had trials. Uh, <laughs> About what year was this? Uh, eight years ago, nine years ago. Um, it was a, it was a steampunk game. Um, but yeah, so um, so the idea is that you have these basically these games that are that are initially inspired from like uh, from like straight up from tabletop. And then you really have like the next generation is games that were I think the whole like and this is me bastardizing this entirely because uh, this whole idea comes from a very brilliant like person who is a friend of mine. Um, but so forgive me, Josh Harrison, if you hear this. Um, but then the second generation is basically built on that. It's kind of step removed from that where they kind of like learned all the stuff um, that they could from like those games and are like okay, so we're going to like take another step from that and actually refine the rules to where they're actually like. This is what you might do if you were actually building a rule system for people to utilize in like live combat. Um, the third generation, I think, was just the idea that there were the games that sort of evolved from those games where they were starting to get away from all the social problems that you had kind of in those circles, 
and then the the current like the fourth generation of LARPing is kind of like the ones is it's I think third generation is really games that adapted rules or like kind of started to understand that like uh, being decent was like part of the contract that you needed to sign with people, and then the fourth generation were games that were literally designed from the ground up to take into account all those social rules. Um, it's interesting how you divide up the generations, because you know, when folks were working on Devia and Beyond the Ether in 2009 and 2012 was when those games respectively launched, we thought of ourselves as, as third generation uh, LARP makers, insofar as like, you know, the, the second gen, you know, like Alliance did work to create a strong physicality um, at least at that point, about quite a few of its rules, you know, whereas like first generation LARPs just really felt like table topping, and it, you know, there were, there were just so many sort of um, glitches or moments where you're just like, wait, like, why why isn't this being fizz wrapped in, in a more dynamic way? This is really um, uh, grounded in, in dice rolls in a way that's, that's unpleasant. Um, but I, I don't know, like I'd be interested in, in hearing from folks like how do you, you respectively um, break up the generations or the, the movements um, uh, between uh, the types of, of LARP structure that you have? Like, I, I would say that like essentially, in, in, at least the generational structure that, that, that Josh Harrison has kind of brought up and that I, I actually strongly agree with is that you actually start to see each generation is essentially like a wave of revenge larks that come from dissatisfied previous years, right? <laughs> like that's that's what that's what the generations are. It's like, oh, this sucks. I'm gonna make my own thing. We're gonna have, you know, not anyways. Like they're gonna have they're gonna have their own things that try to better address the meta critique of the previous generation. So like whenever we whenever you talk about essentially standing around and doing like a parlor arc of holding swords, like, hey, I jump through the portal, oh you see a fire type demon. Okay, dude, it's like, why are you standing in my basement to say that, right? So that's kind of like a first thing. They start to meta analyze like, okay, well, if we're going to do physically in space, we should use physical props. So there's a meta analysis of the problems of the previous generation. So that's what you see with each revenge, is that it's, it, it's, it's, you get dissatisfied with what with, so you try to reformat what previously existed with a higher meta understanding of the problems that are endemic to that thing. So as we start to come out through like, Third generation start to see things like safety marshals, people that existed in the community, like, hey, maybe you should eat and like get sleep, and maybe I should jump into your cabin at 3 a.m. in the morning and stab you, right? Like that's a that's that's a that's a meta critique of previous gameplay. When you come into the fourth generation, we take the understanding that community safety and community inclusiveness must be a part of the game's inherent structure. It can't just be a tacked on system that 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 corrects problems that exist because of the extrapolation of your game rules, you must create a socially inclusive, conscientious play group from the ground up when you're writing combat rules, when you're writing the way that the fiction is structured, from the way that you look at each one of your individual players and how you structure your events. If you like like I think the next wave of American Poffer is gonna be the first wave of American Poffer that has regular workshops before and after their events because that's a major thing that we're missing in, in our that's like that's a huge pitfall in our community building right now. And I think that's going to be that's gonna be one of the things that identifies the fifth generation is more out of game time spent with each other. Would you say the SCA was um, generation zero? Uh -huh. You can, like, I think there were, like, if, I, if I'm, like, I might be re-editing back this way, but, like, it might have been that, like, Nero and stuff was, like, Generation 2, technically speaking, but that, like, you had, like, basically people playing in the backyard, uh, and just, like, creating up rules on the fly, and, like, maybe Amp Guard a little bit, because, like, Amp Guard is, is kind of, like, big LARPing. I mean, I'm, that, I know people that play Amp Guard, but it's, it does seem like, just, like, I, it, Masani, uh, I know that you've done Amp Guard, it's, it's not, Quite the same. It's more on the. Well, in fairness, Amber also spun off of Dead Here, so I mean, there's already a uh, revenge larpy thing, like from that point to Amber. So. Um, so I'm gonna avoid that. Not any other like uh, like mm -hmm. if it was that order. Um, <laughs> so. uh, but uh, don't know. I mean, should should a C be considered the starting point, or should somebody form with that you know codify a, a certain type of rule set that happens to mirror? Um, really 
traditional database management systems in backend software, you know, which had become, which had become proliferating in the workplace um, in the early in the 70s when the, you know, when that style of saying, okay, here's a single entity that can have multiple subsystems attached to it, began proliferating. People suddenly can understand this really quick. Suddenly you can say, hey, um, this one little, you know, box in a grid can have all of these values assigned to it. It's relational. And it became very easy to say, here's a single rule that has a safety mechanic or something like, you know, a set of safety mechanics that are both a set of logistical mechanics, like a set of physical mechanics, um, you know, which was how when you look at like the the, the movement from from D and D to the type of you know crunchy buffer um, that that we're doing that has the, the diagetic one that has you know these, these preconceived story moments that you can deploy with a you know with a piece of foam or a, a, a little spell pack, a little bird seed, a little bean bag, um, like that kind of part. When you compare that to like the SCA finding system, that's like someone hits you in the hand, you lost your hand, you know. Um, it's very different than the type of rule system that lets you, you know, assign values to an item that you can interact with in game that appears drastically different than what it is and has an abstract system that you interact with those values. So, I mean, obviously, there, there must have been cross-pollination with SEA experimental in the late 60s, 67, 69, the latest. Out of Berkeley, apparently, um, I went to the hall where supposedly, again, uh, this little uh, spot that I guess is about to be torn down or something, but you know, the, these cultures, when you try to figure out where these practices came from, it's hard to just say one spot. So it's like a CA work with preparation of this practice, diagnosis. I mean, what else? I'd be curious, do you guys think might have influenced this weird style of that eventually was tacked on pretty much every buffer line. I mean, are there any buffer lines that you like the SCA style and live with them all? Yeah, there actually are. Hmm. Um, I, I would honestly say, like, the, 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 the differentiation that I make between SCA and standard large is that what's it, what, it's basically asking what's the line between uh, recreation and marketing. Like, I, and that, that, that's, kind of, that's a big question in, in, in between those two groups as a whole. Like, is is doing historical recreations like are, are those arts? In a lot of ways, yes. yeah, right. In a lot of ways, yeah, those are. So like, but because it had a totally different classification and because they came from two totally different cultures, you you can see how they like you didn't realize that one was the other until it was, you know, until we're here. I feel like maybe the example that I would have that kind of connects that is that like. It's sort of the same relationship that, like someone wearing a team jersey has to someone cosplaying uh -huh. because they're both kind of cosplaying. Yeah. Um, like you're wearing a team jersey, you're wearing the thing that is the person that you're trying to exemplify in some way or trying to portray in some way, and like the methodology is very different, or the mindset is very different as to where you're going into it, and it's also a lot more work you have to do just buy a jersey online. Yeah. Like for the sake of the story, I think. Um, so what what are the larks that don't have like diagnosis? only have an SCA system where it's a touch system where you don't have a point from point that is going to do some games to the end. Nothing. I mean, I've played games that are in right. race, but yeah. Like, like, they're, yeah. Uh, the Wayfinder tradition okay. is a single hit system. So, um, yeah. so how, how does that work? Uh, one hit, I got your wounds, and you're dead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, they, uh, they, from whatever systems I've developed from, they, uh, their representation, the diagenic representation of the mechanic system is uh, pretty bare bones. They didn't get caught up in trying to recreate um, everything that D&D was doing with fireballs and teleportation, but instead started from an embodied, uh, an embodied way of telling different stories and then started building systems off of that that had to do primarily with embodiment to play first rather than recreating these fantasy systems. It's pretty much like staying there and like in, in that realm. No, it's amazing. Uh, like they and when they have to represent abstract things the way we might mana or mind. There's this one of my favorite things that came out of that was uh, they represent uh, a robot losing battery life by having just a water bottle with a hole in the 
bottom and it just drips out and you have to go refill that. So because that's a principle of their play, uh, that play embodiment is the is the foremost feature, and then the aesthetics come out through relations that it makes it so that their uh, their representative design is um, usually not tied to a numeric system. It's, it's more of a, a metaphor for what's happening and just a simple representation. And I think that, I think to that end, there's <clears throat> uh, what I've kind of seen, like or at least like something that I have seen happening more is that appear, it seems that um, after like decades of people like, okay, so we have these, you know, we start from D&D, we go to like having like maybe some people playing like D&D in their backyard with like weapons they made on cardboard to like, oh, we're going to adapt these rules into a more formalized system to, oh, we're going to take that system then and like adapt it into something that's more sane and rational. And then we're going to take that system and maybe pare it down some because we realize that having all these rules like distances people from the actual like thing they're doing. And now I kind of feel like everything is sort of going back in a certain way to people playing in their backyard where we're kind of getting back to playing pretend again as opposed to worrying as much about like rules of mechanics. So like maybe there is another generation of LARPing that's sort of happening where they're taking into account all those social rules and stuff and also just kind of getting rid of the rest of the rules. Well, it's also considered like a post-mortem contact too has a big influence on this in addition to people who are uh, experiencing LARP foremost rather than, again, adapting these systems. And they, they get into LARP and it's always been, it's been so thoroughly LARP that it's never been the thing that it, it was uh, derived from. So those two things, I think, have an influence on, uh, on that emergence in play. I also think that, like, like a huge, a huge thing that, that, um, that like, I, I think that really matters as far as the reduction of rules is that a lot of times, in American Bachelor, we generate rules in order to create fair play, which, right? Yeah. So, like, we generate rules in order to say, like, hey, if you do this, it will always do this. Like, if, if I'm going to play pretend with my friends who I trust and love to make, like, a good story with me, like, if I act on a big, scary blow and it hits them, they're going to react appropriately. But because in a low-trust environment, like we have in America so frequently, if I do that, I don't know for sure if, like, Stranger Joe is going to act it out or because if he wants to win so bad that he's going to ignore it. So if I create a rule to say, if I hit you with my mighty blow attack, you lose your hit points, right? I mean, of course, Stranger Joe sometimes will just ignore that, too. Exactly. Stranger Joe sucks. But, um, <laughs> like, the, the, the concept that, that we generate rules because we don't have a community of trust is one of the reasons why as we're growing into these more generations, we are generating more community trust, which means that we can start getting rid of the rules again because we don't need them to facilitate good play. If we don't, if we trust each other to narratively and uh, emotionally support each other, then we don't need as many rules to codify how to react to something because you can just trust your friends to make an interesting story. Yes. So I'm interested <coughs> You're saying if you do a really powerful blow, sure. that your friends can act out. Um, but one of the benefits of role playing in general is that you are able to play characters who are not you and have abilities that you do not. Sure. Um, for example, let's say you're playing a trick shooter mm -hmm. and you are targeting one person in a popper style Nerf gun LARP. And you're trying to do a uh, equivalent of a headshot sure. or a specialized body shot, but it's just not within your ability to use a Nerf gun to do that, and shooting a person in the head is not safe anyway. So wouldn't there be a benefit to having rules there and not just pretend so that you can play someone who is more extraordinary in some ways that you Physically, yeah. Yeah. Well, here, here, here's what I'll respond to that with is that, is that like, you can codify those rules and put them in a rule book, or if you're with friends, like, like for example, let's just say that it's like you, me, and like five other friends in our backyard, we're all very close friends, right? You say, I want to play trick shooter, like, I'm really good at shooting stuff. And if we're all, like, cool with that, and we're all having fun, then we're going to act like you shot us, right? We don't, like, but a rule set will codify and it will create clear language to everyone. This is specifically what happens when it happens. And there are benefits and downsides to that. Like, I don't want to say that having high mechanics rule systems are bad. I'm saying that in many cases where the, 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 the game is more driven by narrative exchange than by like fun, buffered, LARP, I mean like mechanics-driven puzzles and like mechanics-driven like combat, 
you don't need those things, and so people, in many cases, if they don't want that, they're just getting rid of it because they can trust each other to not use it. So yeah. there's a benefit to both, but you don't need to have a trick shot skill in order for your friends to be like, oh, you're a trick shot? Cool, I'll just take it like you caught me in the face. It's chill. Yeah. I'm betting in the wider context, we're talking about. <laughs> if you're talking about in the wider context for like not just playing with like just your friends, yeah. I think the way that you pull that off really is that like if you like okay, so this actually goes into like I've been developing this like two page LARP um, where you just find keywords out in the world. Like basically you can like you find keywords out in the world and that kind of defines how you build your character and stuff. So you basically you like you'd fell something and then you like pull a keyword off this and that becomes like a keyword that you can utilize. And so like like a lot of it I think it has to do with like you kind of have to build from the ground up to allow for the system that I'm going to like dictate and it requires utilizing a lot of Nordic techniques to kind of make that happen and workshopping and making sure that people kind of understand that like how you want play to go and how everyone's responsible for each other but like for a skill like headshot for instance where like you could just have like if someone just like basically like in this case with two pointed gun at your direction and you call headshot you have to like in the case of this rule system you would basically have to take whatever the effect you believe that headshot would do. And a uh, quick follow-up, because Nordic has come up a couple of times, can we have a quick definition of what Nordic means in this context? That's fair. Uh, in this context, for sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we're kind of talking about the narrative consensus element of Nordic, yeah. and the, the way they calibrate is, is the term I'm hearing used emotionally, where you, know, you can get people to scale things up and down intensity-wise, but then I, Everything that happens to my character, I consent to. Yeah, yeah. Is my is my understanding of how how I've seen the mechanic work at the one Nordic LARP that I played. So if there's you know other other ways of doing, I don't want to misrepresent it. To be, I don't to be fair, I think it's an overused statement that people use when we're talking about not American buffer. Um, so I'm probably misusing it in a lot of ways. But like the basic thing that I mean when I say that is like it's essentially collaborative narrative driven play as opposed to. Uh, it, like I don't want to say that normal bot like, isn't collaborative, but like it's more it's more about like imposing skills upon each other in order to create cool narratives as opposed to with not working like, hey, let's get together to chat for and then we'll act out the scene. Yes. Um, so I was interested in this idea of trust that you're talking about. Um, in that so in many in many role uh, this is not uh, come to place of judgment, it's come to place of exploration. Yeah, yeah. In many role playing traditions there's this idea of like playing to lose or like oh I will play and whatever happens just happens and that is interesting too um, and in my um, anecdotal understanding because I have not played a bot for a lot before um, that seems not to be a common idea in buffer is what I've heard um, and so that makes me think of this trust that if that becomes a more widespread thing would that also um, remove the need for these very strict rules and you can pare down to simpler rules and that's just a thought. Uh, well, go on. Uh, you know, I, 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 I want to throw out here and please, you know, correct me if, if I'm only citing the LARPs I've encountered, but um, one of my pr critiques of the, the play to lose, because I've heard, um, I, I think Maury and Ben critique it in a talk they gave two years ago where people think that play to lose which is a, a Nordic flirt, um, sort of player paradigm, um, means you're just going to go and create this emo player who has all the bad things happen, and you don't quite want that either. But you know, you do want if you're you have full control of the player's narrative, you want to design the obstacles for your player. Like those aren't going to come from the external world, so you have to have that in mind. Um, whereas in a typical buffer, like the obstacles are not going to necessarily come from within your player, but there's this idea that buffer lampers must be playing to win, um, which I think is kind of a misnomer insofar as there's no win state to, to a, a buffer lamp. You are trying to maintain your, your status or survival in most games. In um, Beyond the Ether, we created a set of consent-based death system based on what we have read of, of Nordic LARPs, and it changed the dynamic of the game significantly. You know, So there are ways to sort of mitigate um, the the dynamics that can happen in the play to maintain status models that can emerge in buffer LARPs. Yeah, and I think also um, the thing about access 
um, and uh, some of the fundamental yeah, uh, material differences between buffer LARPs and then any other LARPs is um, like a, we were talking about if someone gets kicked out of the buffer community, they're not going to replace that with uh, just suddenly going to cons and doing freeform games and replace that with another buffer LARP. Um, because it seems to be that most of the time people find out about uh, buffer LARPs either through friends or on their own and they go there to enact a character of their own devising and then um, the characters usually combine with some fantastic aspect of themselves and then they are using their agency within the system to fulfill this individualistic fantasy within this, uh, this alibi, this fantasy alibi where they can be this aspect of themselves and other people are there to prop it up. Um, but I think the, the preservation of the individual, both in how they find out about it and also the fact that they might attend because it is close rather than it is the thing of choice to them, um, that's another aspect that I think goes again. This idea of playing to win, which is mostly just like playing to sustain my fantastic, like, my fantastic entity without them succumbing to the challenges of the fiction. Like, legitimately just people who do play to win. Like, yeah. it's, not, it's, not a mis it's not a thing that doesn't exist. There are definitely people who, like, a lot of them. do not like losing. Like, that was a problem that we kind of ran into mm -hmm. where, like, with our game a little bit towards the end of stuff where I'm like, where, where like, so I was like, like, Joe, the one you said from the <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah um, Joe sucks. I remember what like, Claire telling me one time, and I was like, hey, I lose all the time in my real life. I don't want to come to a LARP and have the possibility of losing. And I'm like, and I really just had to say to him, I was like, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not running that game. Like, there were consequences and stuff, and there are things, like, you know, like, not, like, the most severe consequences, but like in some cases, it's like, yeah, you might not win in the way you want to win. There might be ways that, like, hey, this is more narratively interesting. And I feel like there is definitely a generation, or at the very least, a portion of that generation that I kind of grew up alarping with, that it still falls in the camp of just like kind of wanting to go and like have a weekend away to be a hero and be insurmountable and just like destroy everything. And I think that like it's not bad for there to be a place for that, but I'm also I think that the games that are being created now don't really account for that type of play. Like video games do that very much, but yeah. LARPs not as much. They is do what now, but we're transitioning away from that. Yeah, I don't think we like that's never been the game that I've been running, um, and we've been running for six years now. But like that's never the game that I've that I've wanted to create or have been interested in creating because like. If you're going to create a game where uh, people always win, you cannot have any kind of like real narrative consequences or anything. You can't have a world where the where the players can really interact with it, because if the players can really like other than like to succeed, um, because like that is really one of the most important things. For, like I mean, that was one of the things that I thought of. Like it was one of the most fundamental things in mind with me was just like when I created a game where I was like I came from a game where like I felt as someone who was helping to run that game that I wasn't allowed to put consequences into plot that I was writing because everything had to reset back to zero before every, before the next event. Mm -hmm. And like that was always one of the most frustrating aspects of it for me. And the thing is, like ultimately, for that game, that was probably right, unfortunately. But that wasn't the right game for me, ultimately. I, I think quickly addressing the concept of trust and playing to win and or lose, um, I think that whenever, like there, 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 are, there are certain power dynamic structures that exist in certain games, like if, if you're in a buffer campaign, campaign LARP where there isn't an official out of game meta structure to how the players are allowed to act and not act, they will create their own clicks and those clicks will accumulate power, right? So those players are accumulating power in a way to try and further their own narratives and further their own, like, again, self preservation so they can preserve this, this, this alter ego because, like, they love that part of themselves. They don't want to lose it. It's about being a person that's empowered. Um, so it's not necessarily about playing to win so much as playing to preserve that sense of self, and they'll do anything, including things that are potentially toxic to the community at large, to accomplish that. So you have to account for that desire for people to have an alter ego into the construction of the game as a whole. Like, you have to understand that so you can create and foster player trust by using the mechanics of the game world. Like, if you don't structure the fiction and the meta rules of your game in a way that allows people to have equal power, then people will use their desire to play to win to absolutely destroy the game that they play. Mm -hmm. we, we were talking about that in the, the other panel discussing about for uh, was that only yesterday? Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, the way um, hierarchies can form, if the, the meta game structure, if you're not addressing that, that reality, you know, um, 
if you allow you know, no level capping or the game world just goes on infinitely and you have characters that have been around for 15 years and are overpowered, you, you have a, a structure in which, you know, all of the new players are dependent on those players for protection or have to ingratiate themselves to them and it can just create really unsavory dynamics. Um, you know, and it's interesting how like in, in the new games, you know, mechanic uh, choices were made. Like folks realized, okay, we can't just tell people be nice to each other. We can't just say, all right, we'll have high B mods and low B mods. We'll divide it up. There's always that wandering monster that gets into the wrong place or something. Um, or at least in, in Alliance and in that that sort of third generation transition, that those were some of the things we were dealing with. Creating role play only spaces where people can spend time. Um, you know, doing doing things to help people who are. Um, who have disabilities or are neuroatypical to feel important in the story and um, you know redesigning the space of the game ended up being part of that rather than just sort of shaming the player base when um, <laughs> these things that were built into the rules or not built into the rules you know it was what I've started calling a nihilistic social apparatus you know something that wasn't built into the rules that ended up creating this predictable negative effect. So. Um one of the questions that was sent to me was, how do you balance mechanics that are des designed to assist inclusion in combat and s systems that rely on partic participants' physical abilities? Similar to what you were asking. Yeah, yeah it's, it's very similar to, to what you were asking. Um, well, I mean, and especially if you start taking into, into account, like, not necessarily just, like, I can't choose to be space with America, but, like, I am a wheelchair, or, like, I mm. have cerebral palsy, or whatever the case may be. And I think, at least for me, like I, I've been working really hard on trying to codify some of my answers to those questions. And I think one of the things, that, the best things that like we as block developers can do, and honestly any game owner can do, is create clear, clear expectations to every person that's coming. Like this is what is at our campsite. We have lips over our doorways. Like we have the ranks that we have are wooden, so you're not able to get them. Like we, you know, we have uh, flashing lights. We are a uh, running, jumping style combat learner. So like if you if I like I'm I can't I can try to be inclusive in every in every design I make and I will do so as much as I can. But cre more than that I have to create clear expectations for every player that's going to come to a combat game so they know if it's a game for them or not. Because it, you can't design for everything. You know, like I can, like you, you just can't. Like I can't I can't have a buffer alert for a person that's blind. Right? I just can't fucking do it. Like just that's not, not, not a thing that I can really like think of doing. So if I create clear expectations and say, hey, hey this game might not be for you because there's no way for it to accommodate for that, then at least I can tell that person, like, hey, I'm sorry, but we just can't accommodate you, and they know to not go. I mean, for, for me, it's, it's less a matter of, like, not being, like, you can create systems and rules that can accommodate, but the problem is it's a matter of resources, depending on how big you are. Like, you have to, like, we have run into the problem at times where it's just like, there was one person in particular whose special accommodations cost more than their ticket price to get into the game. So we lost money by that person being at the event. Mm -hmm. And like there becomes a point in time where like and like the accommodations we had to make to make that person like like didn't work even. Like even after we put in like money and effort, the accommodations that were made didn't like ultimately did not have the effect of like, you know, so it's just like there becomes a point in time where like you do you definitely have to decide like what are the things that you can reasonably handle and what are the things you like you have to agree that like this is something unfortunately that like you as a community like we don't have the money or resources to handle this under certain circumstances and especially from that like from that pure like bottom line perspective where it's just like you know like, like the game that I'm talking about was sort of running on a very thin margin so like that person costing the game money by being there like was like meant that that game like that we lost money running that game. Hmm. You know, it, it, hmm. um, when Brian Gregory um, first began designing Debbie, um, you know, one of those those third generation LARPs, he was he was really drawing from a type of LARP that I guess happens in England that he had, had read about the Mega LARP, in which you might have. A single game in which very different kinds of play are happening in the same game. So you might have a few buffer larpers and a few nerf gun larpers, but you might also have board game style larpers interacting with this like 
map where things are supposedly happening in the outer regions, but you can be in a wheelchair and be very valuable to everybody else in the game by playing that element of the game. And within the metagame structure, we knew who was, was signed up for what, and also you know, very carefully designating important places, like the central place of the game was a role play only zone, so no mob fighting, no nerf gun fighting, and no raids in there. It was the, you know, there was a peace treaty that out of game, we let people know, is truly enforced and it's magically enforced. And, you know, like, there, you know, every spell and thing up the wazoo prevents, you know, so we know that, like, this is a type of safe space and people who are in wheelchairs, you know, can you know, put on a white headband out of game, go back to their cabins, and then cabins are also like a, a combat free zone, um, magically. Um, so there are, you know, ways of ways of building the world, you know, to, to you know, really accommodate different styles of play. And, you know, I, I thought that um, the work done by the Beyond the Ether staff was, was pretty excellent in accommodating um, several folks with disabilities that prevented them from buffering. Um, and who had very different styles of play and different like neuro atypicalities um, uh, in a way that uh, w was not um, a cost issue to the LARP. But you know these like like I'm not sure what the specific situation is that you were dealing with, and you know and it's it's just hard without looking at the bare bones logistics of what we're doing to really. Uh, it, know, was, it was it was actually more um, of a. Uh, it was partly dietary and partly a few other things, but like we basically had gone out of, like it, 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 it was kind of a mix of various things that were kind of involved with that situation specifically. Um, like it's a sort of thing where like if you know that you're going to have a fair amount of people that are um, that have disabilities that would prevent them from taking from from being involved with a lot of common and stuff, I think there is a fair there is a reason for you to put the re there is at least a uh, I'm trying to do this in a way that's like there is basically like. You need to spread spread the cost of a, across like more than one person. So if you only have one person in this setting that has um, that has like mobility issues and such, that it becomes a difficulty to account for a single person, where it would not be as much of a difficulty to account for like three or four, because therefore the resources are spread across, and that you can really create systems that are designed to like uh, provide a play experience for like you know, a group of people that have to be relatively stationary. But, um, but when you, like, I don't know, it, like, I think there is an answer to this, it's, but it's not a, it's not one that I have stumbled across yet, where, like, I, you know, you want to create something where you're not just basically uh, putting a lot of, like, time and energy into entertaining one person. Because, well, so, but why wouldn't you spread that across the cost of everybody? Because the things that were specifically needed for this person in particular uh, were very specific to that person. Like it wasn't that like there weren't other people like. Um, so like why not people pick a price? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Like I mean, technically, I guess it was spread across because it was that. But like realistically, the amount of money that was spent, like on a fundamental level, to like accommodate further dietary needs and such, um, was more than there was more or about equal to the cost of the ticket. Could we like the, pr the primary reason that we didn't increase the price of tickets to accommodate for accommodations is that we have a set ticket price beforehand and they purchase the ticket, mm -hmm. right? So like we would have to retroactively go back and charge people more money. Right. Um, but like to, to more expand upon the thing I said before, because I think I kind of like came off sounding very harsh, but the concept is like I wrote a game with very specifically lots of different roles that you can fill for different mobility levels, right? Like I wrote extensively and like deeply into the concept of like, okay, what if somebody's low mobility? What if somebody can't go on the battlefield? What if somebody doesn't, uh, can't, can't speak loudly? Like, I, I designed intrinsically into the system like the concept of commanders who could use all their skills by voice. I uh, intrinsically set up uh, healers that kind of like were more beneficially used if they were stationary. I, you know, there's a whole bunch of different ways I tried to integrate um, skills for people that were differently able, but at the end of the day, a lot of people that were differently able showed up and said, I don't want to play those classes. And like, at the end of the day, it's like, I understand that you don't want to play those classes, and I understand that you want me to make accommodations to, like, I, I, there were requests for me to have buffer alerts happen in a 20 by 20 area and for it to not move. And it's like, that is not an accommodation I can make. Like, here's your, like, I have to set the expectation of like, this is a full speed buffer combat LARP, and people are going to run away from you. People are going to jump over logs and go into the forested areas. 
And like, I understand that you want to participate in that, but here is an expectation that you can make. Like, I have tried, I've gone so far out of my way to try and design around ways for you to feel like you're meaningfully participate. You don't want to participate in those ways, and that's fine. That's totally cool. There's nothing wrong with that. But at the same time, I'm setting an expectation for you to understand this is what the game is, and the accommodations that you're asking for are not things that uh, I can reasonably meet without changing the entirety of the game. And so, it, at a certain point, it, especially like, okay, think about Amp Guard. If you want to play Amp Guard, you're going to have a hard time if you don't have full mobility. Mm -hmm. And so, just people at Amp Guard saying, hey, this is a full mobility game, and you're going to have a harder time, we're not going to tell you no, but you're probably going to have a hard time playing this game. It, 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 you at least respect the disability enough to say, don't come here with the expectation that we'll be able to make accommodations for you because we can't. I think, that's, I, think that's, I think that's the most important thing that you can do is try to make every accommodation you possibly can, but when those accommodations would break the entire concept of your game, you have to make those expectations clearly known so that people don't come to your game with expectations that will be something different than what it is. Wait, you know, I feel, like, I feel like this is a call to action for people out there to help create uh, new technological apparatuses that can help folks with disabilities have that or experience new systems. really easy, or new systems. Yeah. I mean, we have tons of those out there. I mean, there are tons yeah. of really... We, we, hate, we do actually have to... We, yeah, we do have systems in our game. Like, we do say we have some systems in there. Like, we have literally, there's an ability... Well, one, people can play remotely in our game. Like, you can pay for a ticket online and play remotely because there are skills that let you basically, you can call someone on the phone and basically talk them through healing someone. So, like, someone's in battle, like, that is an ability that someone would have, like, even at home base. Well, like, you pick this, you can use your phone in our game because it's a sci-fi game, so therefore you can literally call someone. So like, people do have the ability to do that with like, you know, they can be like, oh, I'm going to be involved with this uh, battle, but I can't really get to the mod site because campsites for the most part in America are, I mean, this is probably true across the world, but like, campsites for the most part are not accessible. Um, like, even ones that are accessible, there is to a degree that they are not. Um, and so you kind of run into a problem, but like, there are things that we have created that do sort of account that, that do allow for play if you are relatively stationary. Yeah. Did you still have the question? Oh well, well it, it dealt with uh, earlier uh, uh, issues. I don't know if you want to go back to it, uh, but the the concept of playing to win, uh, the uh, idea of uh, is that in a PvP world or player versus GM, which I feel provides very different dynamics. I'd love to hear from Brady. <laughs> okay, so the way that we designed um, this game Envoy, the way we designed the rule set was, um, I would say, it's informed by looking at how blockbusters run, in that there is a trajectory to the game that matches, um, that matches, someone, matches someone's uh, placement on the site. So like everyone registers at the same time, and we consistently have like these classes, or like Magiskel, I suppose, is the biggest one. Classes at this time, then lunch at this time, and basing a basing a, um, a, off of a kind of standardized flow of energy and expectation, adding that structure there, and then also creating a mechanical system that um, did not equate the NPC elements, the environmental elements, mechanically with the uh, with the PCs to say that it wasn't as though NPCs could be built in the same way as PCs. PCs um, necessarily couldn't have a CBC dynamic, they, they couldn't have combat. And instead, um, all of the conflict was, just, they had a competitive, like, inter-house aspect within that. So that was an area of competition they could get into with, you know, some consequence and some benefit, but not something that would sink a game for anyone. And then um, the, the module NPC and the environmental part of it was generated from, um, from another model of creating NPCs that um, <clears throat> that would consistently like work with the skills that um, that were given exclusively to the way that the skills were designed for PCs, so they wouldn't be using them against each other. So some of the uh, and that also involved some heavily embodied things like linking arms um, and uh, yeah, running around holding hands and stuff. Those types of things that in a field battle um, would be overpowering and decimating to uh, to other PCs. So instead, we just balance the system again to be. Uh, P, V, E, and worry about balancing those things instead of worrying about balancing the PC skills against each other. And we got a question? Sure. Um, so it sounds, based on the conversation thus far, the more recent iterations of American popular arts seem to have two main considerations. 
one of them is social. It pertains to accessibility. It pertains to ability and neurodiversity and um, barriers to entry, be they financial or otherwise. And then the other side seems to kind of be a little diametrically opposed in that it's remembering LARP as a business and kind of reconciling accommodation with the fact that, as like Jeremy had mentioned, like sometimes the um, cognizance required to, to establish new LARPs and to make them accessible in whatever way, sometimes is at odds with the like monetary or practicality aspects of running a LARP. And those both seem to kind of be part of the, the newest generation of LARP. Because I know when I started LARPing, it was like mid-second gen for like using yeah. the four things. And like they did not run their game as a business. They were like running their thing as friends for friends and not really understanding like you need policies and you need to actually like budget and stuff like that. How do you reconcile these two kind of diametrically, not necessarily diametrically opposed, but like it can be hard to reconcile like business and like social like integration and awareness in a way that uh, melds seamlessly? How would you recommend handling that? How do you foresee that uh, like changing as we move forward? Does that make sense? Um, I, I, would, I would honestly say that the, the vast majority of things that can improve the game's social accessibility and, and, and lack of toxicity are free things. By structuring your rule systems in a way that allow for high accessibility, um, you can eliminate 99% of the problems that come out of it. Now, as far as making special accommodations, a lot of that comes down to, again, like your vocation. Like, we, in order, to, in order to to accommodate for somebody in a wheelchair, like you have to build new shit. Like, you have to have specific kinds of ramps. You can't have jams in your doorways. You can't have certain enough stairs. Like, they're they're yeah. There, there's there's physical constraints to that, and I think that again, like, we're not. I don't think I don't I don't think that it's not being welcoming to say this is the physical scenario of what's happening. Yeah. This is what to expect, and like giving giving people a full, transparent, and compassionate disclosure about what the game is and isn't. I don't think that's necessarily something that means that it, it's 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 restrictive. It's just saying like this is what we got. Um, I think honestly, the, the, to getting back to the question of like what the change was between these two things and how you like, I think I would like to go to the historical kind of like context on this a little bit because I think that it was a little bit easier for games to be amongst friends when LARPing was a lot cheaper. Mm -hmm. Like the actual fundamentals of actually like renting out a campsite and doing all that stuff was a lot cheaper than it is now. Like I mean, when I started LARPing, um, I started LARPing at a camp that like the game cost forty five dollars an event. Uh, the campsite rental cost was two hundred and fifty dollars for a weekend. Um, like the reality is, is that like that is a very strong difference between like, hey, like let's rent this camp out and we'll go as friends, and then we'll, some something one of your friends ends up with a lot of money because they're suddenly making a lot of money off this one like because that paradigm is and like you know like campsites like I don't I like when I was younger and LARPing and like knew about what the cost of campsites were, I think the most expensive campsite uh, was still less than a thousand dollars. And the reality is now that like um, that like one campsites are actually like degrading, and we're losing campsites, and there's less places that you can rent out, and those places that you can rent out are more expensive. So like like LARPs have had to become businesses because they have no other choice but to become businesses because it can't it isn't just like oh yeah I have like five hundred dollars in the bank how I can rent out this campsite for the weekend and like if people don't show up I'm out like a few hundred bucks and that's it. It's that like if people don't show up. Um, I'm screwed. Like, I don't have the money to repay this amount of money if you're starting up a new game. Um, like, that, that can really be the difference, because, like, realistically, like, you know, because, like, I mean, like, 15, 20 years ago, you know, probably the start, the cost to start up a game, like, if you really didn't care about stuff, like, if you just start up a weekend buffer game, was, like, less than $1,000. And that's, like, with all the starting costs. It was, like, oh, yeah, I bought some plumbing supplies and this, and all that stuff. Like, nowadays, like, you know, if you're not a, if you're not, like, one, you're always a business. Like, if, if you're taking people's money, you're a business. That's just how it works. Um, but the reality that you have to be a responsible business kind of comes hand in hand with the increased cost of LARPing. Because realistically, like, a weekend buffer game should probably cost close, close to $100, but you cannot charge that much because the, bar, the, the market won't allow for it. And, you know, just to sort of center the question on, like, what are the, 
generation buffer alert changes? Like, what, what are the things that we're concerned about developing now? And, um, you know, that being, um, we, we've sort of discussed that as being community safety and, you know, addressing disability accommodations and acknowledging LARP, um, this type of LARP as a business. Um, you know, there are so many other models that have been discussed during this conference that, that are and, and don't need to be, but um, for, for something on, on this scale, um, you know, it's, it's not like 20 friends in a living room, like you need a huge space, you know, there, there are um, so many considerations um, saying yes, like this is a business and we're going to run it well, like I, I do remember, you know, the, like, uh, the joke about Alliance um, or Nero in the early 2000s was that it's a business with one person making all the profit, you know, it's the person we're licensing the rules from, uh, you know, so each chapter pays a thousand dollars to license a set of rules. And uh, then the people who ran the game were usually losing money, usually taking a loss if we um, rented out these campgrounds and um, didn't have enough players uh, arrive to uh, to uh, front the or pay back the <clears throat> the cost of the site. Um, you know, and it's it's been interesting, like watching this transition from the way things were in the early 2000s to this, this, this attitude now, as we were discussing yesterday about um, how, like what I, what I perceive is many LARP makers um, becoming sort of like master crafts people. You know, you get folks who have worked on building a LARP or a LARP community over five or 10 years. And you're, you start having these interesting innovations and in problem solving and as we interact as craftspeople at these these you know conferences, sometimes you'll find out that a, a buffer LARP community or a LARP community elsewhere has found a solution for a type of a thing, a behavior that hadn't been addressed. There was a, an apparatus void in the place where that thing had been, and it's like, wait, your community has community counselors. You know, um, why don't we codify and formalize that role, even though people may have been playing that role? Um, in your chapter before, and I, I would actually be curious to hear from Rhoda, because I, I think this is part of a transition, if you feel, like to what degree has the community counseling work that you've done in um, freeform style arts also perhaps been integrated into boffer art communities or not? Uh, it's the, it's, or not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's uh, on that side because a lot of the practices, like the, the proper practice around that hasn't been um, recorded yet. Um, and the, uh, I practiced in a LARP community uh, for a little bit, uh, and I, I, I forgot about this, but I mentioned it in my last panel. I ended up remembering that someone, the, the position was shut down, and I was told, we didn't have these problems until you had this position. Um, yeah, uh, so... <laughs> So, what? Yeah, yeah. So, like, so, the, like the concept of like a sampling error as opposed to like, yeah. Yeah. No, so, everyone yeah. felt bad until we had a counselor to let them air their problems. Yeah, and, and to speak with game organizers about these are kind of consistent things that are happening with, with players. Um, and uh, I, I think that there's a really, uh, not to involve too much with like talk in another panel, but let's talk about um, potential legality in that, like if a code of ethics exists to have a LARP counselor and a, a way of doing that, and then something a suit comes up against someone due to some sort of harm that happened at a game, then a uh, case can be made to say, like, this literature exists, and if you are not aware of it and employing someone in this capacity, then you are um, uh, creating uh, a risk for your players. Um, but uh, with that said, with the presence of that, and, and it's been modeled, uh, I guess, initially in Boffer, in which it was not so well codified, then um, more structured in Blockbuster, I will say that uh, perceptually, when people can see the difference, uh, as in like people attend two blockbusters in a row, which has happened rarely, but it happens, there are counselors at one and there aren't at another one, people are aware that there is a decline in player quality um, because they can see it. Uh, they can see that, that problems go on, on hand, uh, that the problems don't go, are not handled, and then therefore, um, once they can perceive that things can be safer, they don't forget that. Through a lot of social change, like a lot of like, like difference of like how we see things like we, we like fundamentally like see and respect people at least in the communities that like I'm involved with in a way that we didn't when I was younger um, and you it's like all in reels like like I don't know queer people are more accepted that kind yes of yeah that, that's probably the most fundamental example like you know like 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 
I, like, you know, like, growing up, like, I knew people who were trans, but, like, trans as a thing, like, I don't think it really even existed in, like, the orbit of my thought uh, before, like, five, six years ago, just because, like, I, you know, I had, like, one friend who had, like, transitioned, and, like, that transition was handled very shitty at the alert that, that we had gone to, so they were made so they were not welcome there again. Um, so, like, that was kind of the fundamental, like, thing that I was sort of, like, you know, I saw that, like, and, like, I, I know that's a story that a lot of people have experienced where they, they receive a lot of blowback, but now, like, there, and this is not to say that there aren't games communities that don't still have those as very fundamental problems, but the number of those places that are like that are diminishing, even amongst these, like, old guard, but however, that doesn't mean they haven't, uh, have, don't have all this accumulated baggage from a lot of like really terrible decisions they made over the course of time where they were not like compassionate they did not like show empathy they did not look out for the best of the individual and just kind of wanted to keep this like because there's a weird thing where like I've noticed and like this is a little bit off but like just like that a lot of like early games were made by relatively conservative people mm -hmm. so you have like the, the origins of LARPing uh, like come from a lot of people who were like fairly like conservative people like like all the like the, all the games that I like both like was taking part of it and knew about were more were like and this is not to be entirely derogatory but like were run by Republicans like and so it is a it's weird because that that's kind of not so much the case that well no that's there are still people that do it like there are a few people that run very conservative games um, but, like, it's definitely not as much of a fundamental thing that I'm seeing anymore. We've certainly gone through a cultural shift. I want to comment on hierarchy, too, in terms of, like, communities ending, um, or just turning over. Um, I think a typical Buffalo community is that you have the organizers and directors and then a team of writers and then a team of marshals, maybe, or something, and, um, and then players. And then people get into positions and then there's usually some turnover, like, they stay in that, that hierarchical position and, until they leave. Um, and then someone fills it in and they stay until they leave. And um, the directors are, are usually fixed for a while. Um, there's, that certainly plays into, I think, the larger community around it and how social capital um, moves as a product of, again, all interacting within the system. Uh, I think that, I'm not a Wayfinder kid, I just started working with Wayfinder last year, but the, their model is that they have some, like, some core organizers who take sh make sure that the business is held together, and then they run individual games and events, so they'll hire new game writers, and then people to run their systems, and then people to direct the event. Um, so people, uh, there's turnover, and people can be both players and directors and writers and try out different positions in um, a model that uh, I would be excited to see applied to, um, to like geographically bound buffer games to see how that better distributes like what the community is. Um. One, one thing to kind of like wrap back around to the concept of like why players in a lot of communities get super entrenched in their characters, I think it's very important for us to look as a community at the communities where players do not get permanently entrenched in their characters. Um, I would say that honestly, like Doom is a good example of like high, high character turnover. For the first part of it, like people would play their character for a long period of time, but then people will in, in more more frequently, as the game culture change, people will be more willing to turn up the character because building into the community, a lot of people that play games, like especially in the first and second generation, they generate social capital and uh, a feeling of placement and, and purpose because their character has social status in the game. But if you take away um, a lot of like the ability to accrue permanent toxic power within a fictional game system, then you let people not only let go of their characters more easily, but also generate better relationships with people within the game community, and then their social capital comes from everyone being friends. Like, everyone actually being friends and liking each other in a game changes the dynamic of why people want to stay as characters for so long, because they are no longer attached to the character because they get generous the social capital, they're attached to their friendships because they generate social capital. So if you were given an out for a character and you know that it doesn't mean that you won't have any cool stories to tell, you know that it doesn't mean that you have to like go a part of yourself, it just means that you're moving through another story and you're still gonna be friends and still play with the same people and like everyone's gonna have a good time, you're much more willing to let go. But if you're in a toxic community where I control the power, I'm in charge of you, I make the decisions, and you listen to me, 
if they have to re-roll their character, they're not in that position of power anymore, and nobody has any reason to like deal with them because they, they suck, right? So like, <laughs> you know, it's it, it's interesting because like um, I do think that some of these game culture changes, it's really there's a weight on individual players to to model certain behaviors. Mm -hmm. You know, like when I was playing Alliance, you know, I was playing this sort of informal emotional labor character where I was the tavern keeper who was just a townie and didn't adventure or go out on mods and um, you know people would come up to me and if they were having crises I would take them out of game you know and we'd have a talk you know in the one men's bathroom that no one ever used or whatever you know and like so I was one of the people in the game that sort of played this type of role that was very different than the typical adventurers in the game and I hadn't realized that within that two year period like I had sort of accrued a great deal of social capital and, and all that. And then we had a surge of new players enter, and I, I was seeing that they weren't being you know, integrated very well. And I, I ended up creating a new player, or a new character, you know, that was a, uh, what was it, a, a merchant who uh, claimed to know all of the other characters, since I already knew them about it, and didn't like them. And it was just, ugh, it is disgusting, you know? And, um, and she ingratiated herself to the new player base, and um, you know, it was it was interesting because there were a couple other people in that chapter who also would either create new characters or take on um, you know roles where it was like, oh, kind of like you know, let's let's find ways to pull more people in, let's find ways to sort of cement um, new social fabrics uh, and, uh, um, within the game, um, and there were there were some. Some players that, that really didn't like that, but you know, you just have to push through and, uh, and push for more inclusive culture. And you know, it's it's on a player player to player um, basis. And one of the things that interests me that you just said is that like you had to create a meta structure to integrate new players into the game, right? There, <laughs> because, yeah, because there wasn't a part of their design didn't include a meta structure that allowed players to integrate more easily. Right. So a good thing to do when you're building new games is to generate meta structures that more easily integrate people into the game world. Which yeah, we I mean that's yeah. one of the things we fundamentally did with the changes to, to Doomsday after the five year plan was over where we made it like fundamental as like onboarding was a thing, you know, like you had because like player agency is important and making sure that other like, player feels like they have a place to belong immediately and they're not just thrust out in the world because like as I said the last panel, it's like not everyone can like, on, like, and like this is the transition from tabletop really realistically. Like you know, like on tabletop, everyone can be an adventurer. Um, everyone, because you're a party of five people, you're all the focus all the time, and you don't need to split the focus. But when you have like, when you scale that up, 30, 40, like hundreds of people, you can't have that same. Like thing, and I think that was a fundamental design thing that people didn't take into account for when they were designing those games. It was like, oh, here are all the stats you need. Like, it's kind of like because it just scaled up. It was just like, go out and be an adventurer. But like, you you can't always like not everyone can be the person that fills the you know the, the, the great beast because like realistically only one person can swing a dull blow. Yeah. Unless like you have like some weird rules where you have to like have like eight people all like one at a time. Like, I mean, I would be very interested in. And can the LARP community challenge that? For example, if, if you've heard of Odyssey Works, an interactive theater company that creates huge weekend long immersive theater shows for an audience of one person, and they are a sustain, sustainable business. Um, I've heard them speak at a couple of different conferences. I'm not saying that we need to do this in LARP, but it is. I think sometimes we constrain ourselves too much with, oh, this is impossible, let's never dream about it. Uh, when in fact, you know what, other people do similar things, and maybe it is possible. Well, what, what I will say is that we're talking about problems that exist, but we're also citing examples of good change. Like, yeah. I, what, I, what I would say is that, like, hell yeah, it's possible, we're seeing those changes now. Like, fourth, fourth generation, like, bottle-ups kick ass. Like, there's, like, like, I can think of, like, just within my friend group of people that have generated games that accommodate to this, which is, like, Bright Story, the second version of Doomsday. Like, there are so many games out there that like that, that are coming out that anticipate and plan for community needs and build that from the ground up. So like, yeah, absolutely, it's possible. I think that we talk about a lot of the problems so that we can 
identify those problems when we're creating our meta structures. So we say, hey, watch out for that pitfall. It's going to suck if you miss it. Hey. But like, we never <laughs> Like we like because we know about these problems, like we're, we we have solutions to them. So like it's important that we we hone our craftsmanship and that we become masters in our craft by looking out for problems and then being able to fix them. So look at, like it does sound like we're talking about like everything sucks all the time, but that's just because we're talking about <laughs> we're talking about problems and being like this is how you can fix it, and not necessarily talking about like great examples of how that already exists in the newer games. Out. And we're getting better at all the time. Yeah. I mean, I think that like they're coming, like that, that newer LARPs are coming from a fundamentally different place. Where like every previous generation of LARP was kind of like I mean, we joke about that it's revenge LARP, but it kind of is revenge LARP. Right? <laughs> like, I mean, where like instead of like the newest generation isn't really revenge LARP. It's not coming from a place where like I'm going to take this and fix it. It's coming more from a place of like, what can I do to make the world a better place? Like, and that's kind of really where it's coming down to. It's like, what can I do to make this thing that I love, make the people like make like like provide a value to a community, like build a community where like weird people can come and experience one another and like learn things and like adapt and like change and like fundamentally grow. Like I've seen this happen. Like and this is one of the greatest things. Like people meeting people who like change their lives for the better um, through this thing. And I think that's the experience that I that that like that you can kind of plan for it. But you can. I think that like now that I've done this thing for a long time, you know, like part of the thing that I would do if I were starting over again would be to like, you know, focus on like building the community itself, like starting with a small group of people who like I can fundamentally trust, and then moving slowly out from there so that the community and like the concepts uh, can be like expanded upon and like these like the good things that you can do and that you can gain. And so, like you know, the whole idea of some like one of the panels I was, in was talking about like, the herd mentality, where if you just you know you, you take that like herd mentality kind of concept, where like you bring a few new people in every event, and then those people can kind of like, oh, this is how we treat each other here, this is how we act, these are the reasonable things we do to one another. But yeah, I think that just because it's coming from a place of kindness and not from a place of revenge for that current generation, <laughs> that like it makes a big difference. Certain 
uh, characters that are very racially inappropriate by making them blue instead of black, you know, like we, we uh, tried to get an ocean elf uh, thing uh, into our chapter where, hey look, the dark elves are turning into ocean elves, and that was shut down by HQ, I think there was, you know, it, it's taken them this long to finally turn them purple, you know, that's happening uh, now, like literally now, and it's like, oh, good job guys, like we were trying to do this, and you know, some people were, you know, had worked very hard on, on trying to make, make these changes um, for reasons of avoiding, you know, horrible microaggressions, and like, um, I can confirm that there, that there are no longer gypsies. And there are no longer, oh, thank no. God, thank God, yes, yeah, no, and excuse me, excuse me, and I, I bet, please, you know, please, what, the, yeah, my, my roommate who also worked with me was, you know, an anthropology student, and yeah, there was so much work we, we tried to do from 2,000 miles away to get some of these things changed and to have HQ um, just very adversarial relationship, and often if someone was working on creating new community processes, um, they would be pushed out and replaced by someone who was just a more obedient franchise runner. You know, it was like there was this mindset of like, no, we don't want to become better at what we do. We just want to run the franchise as the franchise with the rule set being licensed appropriately. We don't care if there is a gender balance in the game like that. That wasn't the situation coming in from HQ at that time. Um, you know, so it's, it's been really fascinating to see how with bespoke LARP sets in which the player base and the people who own the rule set or, you know, you know are local or the licensing situation is a little less um, uh, uh, adversarial. Um, you know, how they the, the, the model of um, community craft has been able to evolve, hasn't been thwarted. Um, and I, I just find like everything I'm seeing about contemporary buffer LARP to be really exciting and, and beautiful. And uh, but it also brings up that salty frustration where I, I remember all these things that we tried to do and couldn't under the franchise. Like I wish I had grown up in the world that like I I like I wish I grew up in the world today that was like a buffer LARP day rather than the one that I did. Like I'm glad that I learned the things I did. I'm glad that I made those connections. But like, yeah, there's so much stuff where I was like, oh, like, like how different would things have been if I didn't have to like deal with a lot of incredibly toxic, terrible people uh, who were fundamentally and like, and we didn't think about them. Um, so we're actually at time. Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, sorry, I'd be too. I'd like to give um, Brody. Do you have any parting words? Oh yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, where we are with this is that we're moving out of systems uh, like mechanics and social realities that reinforce certain behaviors, that contextualize things that uh, game writers and organizers consider valuable, and then reward them in other systems into places in which we um, can focus more on communities and what it means to be an individual um, in fantastic play. And the nice thing about where we are with Boffer LARPs now is that there um, are all these other resources and people who are studying experiences and interaction where we can take, again, these social realities that just put different people on top and then hold on to the, the uh, social capital and focus more on creating interesting experiences for an individual within a larger community that dignifies them, puts everyone at play instead of pitting them against each other. Yeah. And, and I'd like to thank everyone for this wonderful positive note, and I can't wait to see what the next generation of Bob Relock brings. <laughs>